We looked at CDC recommendations for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, given an HIV exposed patient, recommend appropriate post-exposure prophylaxis regimen or PEP. When it comes to post-exposure prophylaxis, there are two different guidelines. There is one that's occupational post-exposure prophylaxis or OPEP, which primarily refers to uh, the healthcare setting. For example, if you get a, a needle stick, there is also non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, so things like sexual assault uh, or unprotected sex or uh, uh, you know exposure to injection uh, drug use. We will focus on non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. The recommendations are basically identical. So the post-exposure prophylaxis should be started as soon as possible. However, it should not be started beyond 72 hours. So it's only effective as long as it's started within 72 hours. And because that this is post-exposure, so possibly the virus could be inside the, the patient's body. Therefore, uh, as opposed to pre-exposure prophylaxis, which was just the backbone, the post-exposure prophylaxis includes the full treatment. So you need the backbone, which is typically ten tenofovir, uh, desoproxol, m plus a third agent, which is either raltegravir or dalutegravir. And alternatively, this third agent could be darunavir uh, boosted with ritonavir. So these are the agents that have been studied, so that's why uh, we shouldn't use anything else. For example, Bictegravir and uh, Elvitegravir have not been studied for post-exposure prophylaxis. So our options are Raltegravir and Dalutegravir and Darunavir. Another thing to note is that Raltegravir uh, twice a day dosing is studied for post-exposure prophylaxis. So the more recent formulation of Raltegravir that's dosed once daily should not be used for, uh, for PEP. It's only for treatment of HIV. And lastly, uh, the new formulation of Tenofovir, TAF, uh, which recently got the uh, indication for PrEP, it's uh, not indicated for post-exposure prophylaxis. So it has not been studied for PEP uh, as of yet. So therefore, uh, we have to use uh, Truvada as the backbone plus a third agent. And of course, we don't use a Bakavir based backbone because there is no time to check for HLA B5701. We got to start treatment within 72 hours. And the treatment is for 28, uh, 28 days. So this is fixed. So we just treat uh, for 28 days uh, and hopefully uh, after four weeks, the patient will not develop HIV infection. As always, it's important to provide education to the patient regarding adverse effects, as well as checking for uh, potential drug-drug interactions. So basically, when someone gets exposed uh, to the virus, uh, of course, if the, uh, you know, the risk is negligible, the PEP is not uh, needed. But if there is a reasonable um, evidence that the patient has been exposed to the HIV, uh, if it's been more than 72 hours since exposure, then PEP is not recommended. We'll just wait to check for HIV, and if the patient develops HIV, you just treat the HIV, because uh, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis will not be effective. But if it's been less than 72 hours, now post-exposure prophylaxis will be very effective, so there's potential to prevent HIV infection. Now, uh, if we do know the source, so for example, if somebody uh, had unprotected sex uh, with someone, um, you know, we can potentially uh, test the source and see if they're HIV positive or HIV negative. So if someone happens to be HIV positive, then definitely we get we start post exposure prophylaxis. Um, and then if we don't know the source, uh, for example, in cases of sexual assault or rape, uh, we just have to go case by case uh, basis. In most cases, we would actually go ahead and uh, do post exposure prophylaxis. Now, when it comes to monitoring for post exposure prophylaxis, so if we do know the source of the infection, uh, you know, it's helpful to check for HIV to see if the source actually had HIV because if they didn't, then uh, post-exposure prophylaxis will be unlikely and then some of the other things that uh, kind of uh, can be transmitted in the same way such as hep B, hep C and some of the sexually transmitted infections like uh, chlamydia, uh, gonorrhea and syphilis uh, these should be also tested um, in the source uh, 
and then in the patient who was exposed also they need to be tested for HIV as well as for Hep B, Hep C and uh, sexually transmitted infections and then because we are to start post-exposure prophylaxis we also need a uh, serum creatinine and uh, liver chemistries because we're going to use Truvada and um, you know depending on whether you use Raltegravir, Dalutegravir or Darunavir these will be used for monitoring and then in four to six weeks uh, we check for HIV again that, uh, that will be at the end of treatment so treatment is basically for four weeks or 28 uh, days so we check one last uh, one, uh, one more time and then one last time we check HIV three months after exposure just to make sure that uh, post exposure prophylaxis actually worked so if this one comes out to be negative we know that post exposure prophylaxis worked and the patient did not get HIV on the other hand if this test positive uh, then unfortunately the patient is diagnosed with HIV and then they need to go on lifetime uh, treatment uh, now, one scenario where you would uh, need to check HIV uh, six months after exposure if someone uh, also get test positive for hep, uh, for hep C because it's been shown that people who have hep C um, while they were uh, exposed to HIV, the seroconversion, uh, meaning uh, development of antibodies, uh, will be delayed. So you would be detecting that at six months. So that's the only time you would uh, get it at six months. And of course, uh, in uh, females of reproductive age, uh, we also check for pregnancy at baseline and then at the at the end of treatment. And that's really uh, just to make sure that uh, we um, do a better job of follow up because if the patient does develop HIV, they can uh, the patient can uh, transmit the virus to the uh, to the fetus. Now, depending on the situation on how the patient got exposed to the uh, to to the virus for example if it was unprotected sex um, and the patient if the patient has that risky behavior frequently it might be a good uh, you know intervention to transition uh, from PEP to PrEP so once we complete the 28 days of post exposure prophylaxis you know we can have a conversation with the patient after if, if they think that they will continue the risky behavior after PEP, if the PEP was successful and the patient did not develop HIV infection, then upon a negative HIV test, we can actually give patient PrEP. So, you know, depending on whether you gave patient a PEP formulation, um, either, um, you know, Raltegravir with Truvada or Dalutegravir with Truvada or uh, Darunavir with uh, Truvada, this will be for 28 days. And then after 28 days, you just give them Truvada as PrEP. And they will be on Truvada as long as they continue the risky behavior. Now, the Senate Bill 159, SB 159, that will be uh, effective July 2020, uh, expanded services of pharmacists uh, to HIV PrEP as well as HIV PEP. So pharmacies can uh, furnish HIV post-exposure prophylaxis starting July of 2020. Uh, as long as the pharmacy gets a uh, training in it so typically uh, i imagine a one hour ce will be required or or maybe if um, more ce's uh, but most importantly the pharmacist can furnish a complete course and uh, now they don't specify what complete course is but they do say that uh, you know they will be referring to the cdc uh, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis guideline which would define the complete course as 28 days so what they really mean here is a 28 day course of post exposure prophylaxis and then uh, they follow the same uh, requirements as the cdc guidelines so, so so it has to be within 72 hours of exposure and uh, just like prep you know the pharmacy is required to uh, provide the full counseling to the patient uh, including transition to prep and uh, the patient may not actually waive this consultation so it's actually required 